So uh, I'm going to read from the opening of a new story that will be out in about a month and then in a collection uh, called I Can See Right Through You. It's probably about the first third. <coughs> It's a, it's a hard first sentence to read. When the sex tape happened and things went south with Vaughn, the demon lover did what he always did. He went to cry on Maggie's shoulder. Girls like Vaughn came and went, but Maggie would always be there. Him and Maggie, it was the talisman you kept in your pocket, the one you couldn't lose. Two monsters can kiss in a movie. One old friend can go to see another old friend and be sure of his welcome. So here is the demon lover in a rental car. An hour into the drive, he opens the window of the rental car tosses out his cell phone. There's no one he wants to talk to except for Maggie. 1991. This is after the movie and after they are together and after they begin to understand the bargain that they have made. They are both suddenly very famous. Film can be put together in any order, scene shot in any order of sequence. Take as many takes as you like. Continuity is independent of linear time. Sometimes you aren't even in the same scene together. Maggie says her lines to your stand-in. They'll splice you together later on. Shuffle off to Buffalo Gals, come out tonight. This is long before any of that. This was a very long time ago. Maggie tells the demon lover a story. Two girls, and look, they've found a Ouija board. They make a list of questions. One girl is pretty. One girl is not really a part of the story. She's lost her favorite sweater. Her fingertips on the planchette. Two girls, each touching lightly the planchette. Is anyone here? Where did I put my blue sweater? Will anyone ever love me? Things like that. They ask their questions. The planchette drifts, gives up nonsense. They start the list over again. Is anyone here? Will I be famous? Where is my blue sweater? The planchette jerks under their fingers. M-E. Maggie says, did you do that? The other girl says she didn't. M-E-G, Maggie. It's talking to you, the other girl says. M-E-G-G-I-E, -G -G Maggie, hello. Maggie says, hello. The pla planchette moves again and again. There's something animal about it. H-E-L-L-O, I am always with you. I am with you always. They write it all down. M-E-G-G-I-E-O, Maggie, oh, I will love you always. Who is this, she says. Who are you? Do I know you? I-S-E-E-Y-O-U. I see you. I know you. Wait, and I will come. A pause, then. I-W-I-L-L-M. I will, Maggie, oh, I will be with you always. Are you doing this, Maggie says to the other girl. She shakes her head. M-E-G, Maggie, wait. The other girl says, can whoever this is at least tell me where I left my sweater? <laughs> <laughs> Maggie says, okay, whoever you are, I'll wait. I guess I can wait for a while. I'm not good at waiting, but I'll wait. O-W-A-I-T, oh wait, and I will come. They wait. Will there be a knock at the bedroom door? But no one comes. No one is coming. I-A-M-W-I-T, I am with you always. No one is here with them, the sweater, Will never be found. <laughs> the other girl grows up, lives a long and happy life. Maggie goes out to LA and meets the demon lover. W-A-I-T. <laughs> After that, the only thing the planchette says over and over again is Maggie's name. It's all very romantic. 1974, 22 people disappear from a nudist colony in Lake Apopka. People disappear all the time. Let's be honest, the only thing interesting here is that these people were naked <laughs> and that no one ever saw them again. Funny, right? 1990. It's one of the 10 most iconic movie kisses of all time. <coughs> Top five, surely. You and Maggie, the demon lover, and his monster girl, vampire sharing a kiss as the sun comes up. Both of you wearing so much makeup, it still astonishes you that anyone would ever recognize you on the street. It's hard for the demon lover to grow old. Florida is California on a trauma budget. That's what the demon lover thinks anyway. <laughs> Special effects, blue budget, and bugs, and bad weather. He parks in a meadowy space recently mowed alongside other rental cars, the usual catering and equipment vans. There are two gate posts with a chain between them. No fence. Eternal, I endure. There's an evil smell. Does it belong to the place or to him? The demon lover sniffs under his arms. 
It's an end of the world sky, a snakes and ladders landscape, low emerald trees pulled lower by vines, chalk and apricot anthills. The demon lover imagines the bones of a nudist under every one. Shallow, water-filled declivities scummed with algae, lime and gold and black. The blot of the lake, that's another theory, the lake. A storm is coming. He doesn't get out of his car. He rolls the window down and watches the storm come in. Let's look at him, looking at it, a pretty thing, admiring a pretty thing. Abandoned sight of a mass disappearance, muddy violet clouds, silver veils of rain driving down the lake. The tabloid prince of darkness, Maggie's demon lover arriving in all his splendor. The only thing to spoil it are the bugs and the sex tape. <laughs> 2012, you have been famous for more than half of your life, both of you. You only made the one movie together, but people still stop you on the street to ask about Maggie. Is she happy? Which one you want to ask them? The one who kissed me in a movie when we were just kids, the one who wasn't real, the one who likes to smoke a bit of weed and text me about her neighbor's pet goat, the Maggie in the tabloids who drinks, fucks, gets fat, pregnant, too skinny, flaps a mater D, talks to Elvis's ghost. Sometimes they don't ask about Maggie, instead they ask if you will bite them. Happiness, misery, if you were one, bet on it the other was on the way. That was what everyone liked to see. It was what the whole thing was about. The demon lover has a pair of gold cuff links, those faces. Maggie gave them to him. You know the ones I mean. 2010, Maggie and the demon lover throw a Halloween party for everyone they know. They do this every Halloween. They're famous for it. Year after year, on a monkey's face, a monkey's face, Maggie says. She's King Kong. The year before, half a pantomime horse. He's the demon lover. Who else? Year after year. Maggie says, I've decided to give up acting. I'm going to be a poet. Nobody cares when poets get old. Fawn says, appraisingly, I hope I look half as good as you when I'm your age. Fawn, 23, a makeup artist. This year, she and the demon lover are married. Last year, they met on set. He says, I'm thinking I could get some work done on my jawline. You'd think they were mother and daughter, same Viking profile, same quizzical tilt to the head as they turned to look at him, both taller than him, both smarter too, no doubt about it. Maybe Maggie wonders sometimes about the woman he sleeps with, marries. Maybe he has a type, but so does she. There's a guy at the Halloween party, a boy, really. Maggie always has a boy, and the demon lover can always pick him out, easy enough, even if Maggie's sly. She never introduces the lover of the moment, never brings them into conversations, or even acknowledges their presence. They hang out on the edge of whatever is happening, and drink or smoke, or watch Maggie at the center. Sometimes they drift closer, or stand near enough to Maggie that it's plain what's going on. When she leaves, they follow after. Maggie's type, the funny thing is Maggie's lovers all look like the demon lover, more like the demon lover he admits it than he does. He and Maggie are both older now, but the world is full of beautiful black haired boys and golden girls, really, that's the problem. The role of the demon lover comes with certain <coughs> obligations. Your hairline will not recede, your waistline will not expand, you are not to be photographed threatening paparazzi or in sweatpants, no sex tapes. <laughs> Your fans will offer their necks at premieres, also at restaurants and at the bank, more than once when he is standing in front of a urinal. Ask if you will bite their wives, their daughters, they will cut themselves with a razor in front of you. The appropriate reaction is, there is no appropriate reaction. <laughs> the demon lover does not always live up to his obligations. There is a sex tape, there is a girl with a piercing, there is in the middle of some athletic sex a comical incident involving his foreskin. There is blood all over the sheets. There's a lot of blood. There's a 911 call. There's 911 call. There's him fainting, falling and hitting his head on a bedside table. There's Prez Hilton, Gawker, Talk Radio, YouTube, Tumblr. There are gifts. <laughs> you will always be most famous for playing the lead in a series of vampire movies. The character you play is, of course, ageless, but you get older. The first time you bite a girl's neck, Maggie's neck, you're a 25-year-old actor playing a vampire who hasn't gotten a day older in 300 years. Now you're a 49-year-old actor playing the same ageless vampire. It's getting to be a little ridiculous, isn't it? But if the demon lover isn't the demon lover, then who is he? Who are you? Other projects disappoint. Your agent says take a comic role. The trouble is you're not very funny. You're not good at funny. The other trouble is the sex tape. Sex tapes are inherently funny. Nudity, nudity is, regrettably, funny. Torn foreskins are painfully funny. You didn't know she was filming it. Your agent says, that wasn't what I meant. <laughs> <laughs> you can do what Maggie did all those years ago, disappear, travel the world, hunt down the meaning of life, go find Maggie. When the sex tape happens, you say to Fawn, but what, what does this have to do with Maggie? This has nothing to do with Maggie. It was just some girl. The 
it's not like there haven't been other girls. Vaughn mm -hmm. says, it has everything to do with Mikey. I can see right through you, Vaughn says, less in sorrow than in anger. She probably can. God grant me Maggie, but not just yet. That's him by way of St. Augustine, by way of Fawn, the makeup artist and Bible group junkie. She explains it to the demon lover, explains him to himself. And hasn't it been in the back of your mind all this time? It was Maggie right at the start. Why shouldn't it be Maggie again? And in the meantime, you could get married once in a while and never worry about whether or not it worked out. He and Maggie have managed all this time to stay friends. His marriages, his other relationships, perhaps these have only been a series of delaying actions, small rebellions. And here's the thing about his marriages. He's never managed to stay friends with his ex-wives, his exes. He and Fawn won't be friends. The demon lover and Maggie have known each other for such a long time. No one knows him like Maggie. The remains of the nudist colony at Lake Apopka promise reasonable value for ghost hunters, a dozen ruined cabins, some roofless windows, some roofless, windows black with mildew, a crumbled stucco hall, Spanish tiles receding, the cracked lip of a slop-filled pool. Between the cabins and the lake, the homely and welcome sight of half a dozen trailers, even better, he spots a craft tent. Muck farms, mutant alligators, disappearing nudists. The demon lover killing time in the LAX airport right up on Lake Apopka in the past is a weird place. Florida is a weird place, no news there. A demon lover should fit right in, but the ground sucks and clots at his shoes in a way that suggests he isn't welcome. The rain is directly overhead now, shouting down in spit-warm gouts. He begins to run, stumbling in the direction of the craft tent. Maggie's career is on the upswing. Everyone agrees she has a ghost hunting show. Who's there? The demon lover calls Maggie after the Titanic episode airs, the one where the Who's There ghost hunting crew hitches a ride with the International Ice Patrol. There's a yearly ceremony, memorial reads. Maggie's crew sets up a Marconi transmitter and receiver just in case a ghost or two has a thing to say. The demon lover asks her about the dead seagulls. Forget the Marconi nonsense, the seagulls for what made the episode, hundreds of them, little corpses fixed as if pinned to the water. Maggie says, you think we have the budget for fake seagulls, please? <laughs> Admit that who's there is entertaining whether or not you believe in ghosts. It's all about the nasty detail, the house that gives you a bad feeling even when you turn on all the lights the awful thing that happened to someone who wasn't you a long time ago. The camera work is moody. The team of ghost hunters is personable, funny, reasonably attractive. Maggie sells you on the possibility. Maybe what's going on here is real. Maybe someone is out there. Maybe they have something to say. The demon lover and Maggie don't talk for months, and then suddenly something changes and they talk every day. He likes to wake up in the morning and call her. They can talk about scripts, know that Maggie's getting scripts again. <clears throat> He can talk to Maggie about anything. It's been that way all along. They haven't talked since the sex tape. Better to have this conversation in person. 1991, he and Maggie are lovers. Their movie is big at the box office. Everywhere they go, they are famous and they go everywhere. Their faces are everywhere. They are kissing on a thousand screens. They are in a hotel room kissing. They can't leave their hotel room without someone screaming or fainting or pointing something at them. They're asked the same questions again, over and over. There's a night on some continent in some city, some hotel room, some warm night. The demon lover and Maggie leave a window open and two women creep in. They come over the balcony. They just want to tell you that they love you, both of you. They just want to be near you. Everyone watches you, even when they're pretending not to. And even when they're not watching you, you think they are. And you know what? You're right. Eyes will find you. Becoming famous, this kind of fame, it's luck and distinguishable from catastrophe. You'd be dumb not to recognize it. When people disappear, there's always the chance that you'll see them again. The rain comes down so hard the demon lover can barely see. He thinks he is still moving in the direction of the craft tent and not the lake. There's a noise. He picks it out of the noise of the rain, howling. And then the rain thins and he can see something, men and women, naked, running toward him. He slips, catches himself, and the rain comes down hard again, erases everything except the sound of what is chasing him. He collides headlong with a thing, a skin, horribly clammy, cold, somehow both stiff and yielding, bounces off and realizes that this is the tent. Not where you choose to make a last stand, but by the time he has fumbled his way inside the slab, he has grasped the situation. Not dead nudists, but living people, naked, cursing, laughing, dripping. They carry cameras, mics, gear for ghost hunting, videographers, A2s, all the other useful types and the not so useful. A crowd of men and women, and here is Maggie, 
Her hair is glued in strings to her face. Her breasts are wet with rain. He says her name. They all look at him. How is it possible that he is the one who feels naked? What the fuck is this guy doing here, says someone, with a little white towel positioned over his genitals. Really, it could be even smaller. <laughs> well, Maggie says, so gently he almost starts to cry. Well, it's been a long day. She takes him to her trailer. He has a shower, bars her toothbrush. She puts on a robe, doesn't ask him any questions, talks to him while he's in the bathroom. He leaves the door open. It's the third day on location, and the first two have been a mixed bag. They got their establishing shots, then went out on the lake and saw an alligator dive down when they got too close. Their baby skunks all over the scrubby, shabby woods, the trails, they come right up to you, up to the camera, and try like hell to spray. But until they hit adolescence, all they can do is cover their tails and stamp their feet. Except, she says, I mentioned some poor A2. His skunk was an early bloomer. <laughs> Maggie interviewed the former proprietor of the nudist colony. He insisted on calling it a naturist community, spent the interview explaining the philosophy behind naturism, didn't want to talk about 1974, a harmless old crank. Whatever happened, he had nothing to do with it. You couldn't lecture people into thin air. Besides, he had an alibi. What they didn't get on the first day, or even on the second day, was any kind of worthwhile lead on their equipment. They have the two psychics, but one of them had an emergency, went back to deal with a daughter in rehab. They have all kinds of psychometric equipment, but there's absolutely nothing going on, down or off, which led to some discussion. They decided maybe we were the problem, Maggie says. Maybe the nudists didn't want to have anything, didn't have anything to say to us while we had our clothes on. So we're shooting in the nude. Everyone nude, cast, crew, everyone. It's been a really positive experience while it's a good group of people. <laughs> Fun, the demon lover says. Someone has dropped off a pair of pink cargo shorts and a t-shirt because his clothes are in a suitcase back in the airport in Orlando. It's not exactly that he forgot, more like he couldn't be bothered. It's good to see you, Will, Maggie says, but why are you here exactly? How did you know we were here? He takes the easy question first, Pike. Pike is Maggie's agent and an old friend of the demon lover, the kind of friend who finds life all the sweeter when you're in the middle of screwing up your own. I made a promise not to tell you I was coming. He flops down on the floor in front of Maggie's chair. She runs her fingers through his hair. Pets him like you pet a dog. He told you that, didn't he? He did, Maggie said. He called. The demon lover says, Maggie, this isn't about the sex tape. Maggie says, I know. The phone called too. He tries not to imagine that phone call. His head is sore. He's dehydrated. That long flight. Maggie says she wanted me to let you know. She wanted me to let her know if you showed, said she was waiting to see before she threw on the towel. She waits for him to say something, waits a little bit longer, strokes his hair the whole time. I won't call her, she says. You ought to go back, Will. She's a good person. I don't love her, the demon lover says. Well, Maggie says. She takes that hand away. There's a knock on the there's a knock on the door, some girl sends out again Maggie. She gives the demon lover a particularly melting smile was probably 12 when she first saw him on screen. Baby ducks these girls, imprint on the first vampire they ever see. <laughs> then she's down the stairs again, bare bottom bouncing. Maggie drops the robe, begins to apply sunblock to her arms and face. Let me, he says, and takes the bottle from her, begins to run sunblock into her back. She doesn't flinch away. Why would she? They are friends. She says, here's the thing about Florida, Will. You get these storms practically every day, but then they go away again. Her hands catch at his, slippery with the sunblock. She says, you must be tired, take a nap. There's herbal tea in the cupboards, pot and ambient in the bedroom. We're shooting all afternoon, straight through to evening. And then a barbecue, we're filming that too. You're welcome to come out. It would be great publicity for us, of course. Our viewers would love it. But you'd have to do it naked, like the rest of us, no clothes. No exceptions, Will, not even for you. He rubs the rest of the sunblock into her shoulders, would like nothing more than to rest his head on her shoulder. I love you, Maggie, he says. You know that, right? I know, I love you too well, she says. The way she says it tells him everything. The demon lover goes to lie down on Maggie's bed feeling 100 years old, dozes, dreams about a bungalow in Venice Beach and Maggie and a girl. That was a long time ago. There was a review of a play Maggie was in maybe 10 years ago. It wasn't a kind review or even particularly intelligent, and yet the critic said something that still seems right to the demon lover. He said no matter what was happening in the play, Maggie's performance suggested she was waiting for a bus. The demon lover thinks the critic got at something true there, only the demon lover has always thought that if Maggie was waiting for a bus, you had to wonder where the bus was going, if she was planning on throwing herself under it. When they first got together, the demon lover was pretty sure he was what Maggie had been waiting for. Maybe she thought so too. They bought a house, a bungalow, in Venice Beach. 
who wonders who lives there now. When the demon lover wakes up, he takes off the t-shirt and cargo shorts, leaves them folded neatly on the bed. He'll have to find somewhere to sleep tonight, and soon day is becoming night. Meat is cooking on a barbecue. The demon lover isn't sure when he last ate. There's bug spray beside the door, ticklish on his balls. He feels just a little bit ridiculous. Surely this is a terrible idea, the latest in a long series of terrible ideas. Only this time he knows there's a camera. The moment he steps outside Maggie's trailer, a PA appears as if by magic, that's what they do. Has him sign a pile of releases, odd to stand here in the nude signing releases. But what the fuck, he thinks, I'll go home tomorrow. The PA is in her 50s, unusual. There's probably a story there, but who cares? He doesn't. Of course she's seen the fucking sex tape. It's probably going to be the most popular movie he ever makes. But her expression suggests that this is the very first time she's ever seen the demon lover naked, or rather, that neither of them is naked at all. While the demon lover signs, doesn't bother to read anything, what would it matter now anyway? The PA talks about someone who hasn't done something, who isn't where she ought to be. The mother gopher named Juliet, where is she and what has she gone for? The PA is full of complaints. The demon lover suggests the gopher may have been carried off by ghosts. The PA gives him an unfriendly look and continues to talk about people the demon lover doesn't know, has no interest in. What's spooky about you? The demon lover asks. Because of course that's the gimmick, producer down to best boy, every man and woman uncanny. I had a near-death experience, the PA says. She wiggles her arm, shows off a long, rippy burn, accidentally electrocuted myself, got the whole tunnel and light thing, and I guess I scored okay with those cards when they auditioned me. So tell me, the demon lover says, what's so fucking great about a tunnel and a light? That really the best they can do? <laughs> yeah, well, the PA says, a bite in her voice. People like you probably get the red carpet in the limo. <laughs> <laughs> the demon lover has nothing to say to that. You seen anything here? Kathy <coughs> said. Heard anything? Maggie tell you about the skunk, the PA says. Having snapped, now she will sue. Those babies, tails up the works, but nothing doing. Which about sums up this place? No ghosts. No read on the equipment, no hanky-panky, fiddle-faddle, or woo-woo, not even a cold spot. She says doubtfully, but it'll come together. You at the seance, barbecue, shindig will help. Naked vampire trumps nudist ghost any day. Okay, on your own, you go on down to the lake. I'll call, let them know you're on your way. Or you could just head for the car. Thanks, the demon lover says. But before he knows what he wants to do, here's another someone. It's a regular pilgrim's progress. This is a kid in his 20s, good looking in a familiar way. Although, is it okay to think this about another guy when you're both naked, not to mention who looks a lot like you did once upon a time? Why not? We're all naked here. <laughs> I know you, the kid says. The demon lover says, of course you do. You are? <laughs> Ray, says the kid. He's maybe 25. His look says, you know who I am. Maggie's told me all about you. As if he doesn't already know, the demon lover says, so what do you do? The kid smiles an unlovely smile, scratches at his groin luxuriously, maybe not on purpose. Whatever needs to be done, that's what I do. So he deals. There's that pot in Maggie's dresser. Down at the lake, people are playing volleyball in a pit with no net, barbecuing. Someone talks to a camera, gestures at someone else, someone, some, someone somewhere smoking a joint. At this distance, not too close, not too near, twilight coming down. The demon lover takes in all of the breasts, asses, comical cocks, knobby knees, everything hidden, now made plain. He notes, with an experienced eye, which breasts are real, which aren't. Only a few of the women sport pubic hair. He's never understood what that's about. Some of the men are bare too. O tempora, O mores. <laughs> you like jokes? Ray says, stopping to light a cigarette. The demon lover could leave. He lingers. Depends on the joke. All right, I'm gonna stop there. Uh -huh. <laughs>